Good morning, everyone. Ah, welcome. And it is a good day to be gathered as God's people. Um, let's take some time silently as we begin this week, this week that God has given us, this day that is His, to start the week. Um, let us uh, give thanks and ask that God would prepare us for this first great duty of our week, to worship Him uh, as his people. Let us pray silently. From the rising of the sun, O Lord, to the going down of the same, your name shall be praised. Your name is great among the nations. Uh, Lord, we, we pray, mindful that we are joining with the heavenly host in praising you, mindful that our voices rise to you with every one of your children on this globe. So we pray, O oh Lord, that our hearts would reflect that joy and that, and that mystery that you have gathered a people from every nation, tribe, tongue to sing praises to your name while you, be, while you may be found. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand up this morning. From the Word of God in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. A greeting. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Our call to worship from Psalm 148. You may discern a theme Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Praise Him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever he has made a decree which will not pass away. Let's sing this Psalm 148 using hymn number 110. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, number 110. <laughs> Yeah. 
pray with me. Great God who is self-existent, indeed in whom all things hold together and exist. Without your will does nothing continue to exist because you are being. You are the power that is eternal you have neither beginning nor end. And from you comes all life. For in you we live and move and have our being. So many, O oh Lord our God, are the wonders you have done. You have parted the seas. You have delivered your people. You have sent your Son, Jesus Christ. You have redeemed us by his blood. You have glorified your name in your people. There's none to compare with you. It's amazing that you think of us at all. For you know every little thing. In fact, if we were to try to declare or speak of them, we would not have the time. They would be too numerous to count. And so, Lord, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you and thank you for bringing us here and gathering us to praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's be all seated. The law of God is... The law of God is God's expression. More than an expression, it is his will. It is how he has told us what it is our duty before him is. Our catechism says that the scripture principally teaches two things. What we are to believe about God and what our God would require us as a duty. There is no better and more compact an expression of this than the moral law expressed in the Ten Commandments. May we hear them and be driven to see our sinfulness and our need for Christ as Christians. And may we rejoice that they are kept, fulfilled in Jesus Christ through his act of obedience. From Exodus 20. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven, above or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations, those who hate me, but showing loving kindness, that is mercy, love, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work and labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. For God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Let us pray. O Lord, who is righteous beyond our comprehension, who is good, full of compassion, yet, Lord, who is holy, you, you are above all things incomparable to us. You are different we are dependent on you for every breath we take, and you, Lord, you are not. You exist because you are who you are, for you have revealed yourself as I am to your people. So we pray, O oh Lord, don't withhold your compassion from us. We are sinners. We transgress your law. We think the wrong things. We desire the wrong things. We love the wrong things. Our hearts are aimless apart from your intervention in our lives. And we stand before you openly accused on the basis of our sin. But Lord, it is your loving kindness and your truth that will continually preserve us. Even though evils beyond number have surrounded us, our, our sins have overtaken us, that we're not even able to see the depth of them, for they are more numerous than the hairs of our heads, and our hearts have failed us. You are greater than our hearts. You are greater than our sin. So we pray and we ask that you would be pleased, O Lord, to deliver us, to forgive us our sins, and to give us the assurance of our salvation because and for no other reason than this, than your Son, Jesus Christ, has died for us on the cross and has raised, has been raised, and is now seated at your right hand praying for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, please. Isaiah 53, 6, a very familiar words to all of us uh, as our assurance of forgiveness. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. Let us profess our faith using the Westminster Shorter Catechism. You'll find that in the bulletin. Uh, this is questions 4, 5, and 6 from the Westminster Shorter Catechism in the morning, it says there. Question number four. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Are there more gods than one? There is but one only, the living and true God. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Number 690, I know that my Redeemer lives. Let us sing that, number 690.
be seated again. As we go to the Lord in prayer, let us consider Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3, as an introduction to that. Give ear to our words, O Lord, consider our groaning. Heed the sound of our cry for help, our King and our God, for to you we pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear our voice. In the morning, we will order our prayer to you and eagerly watch. Let us pray. Lord God, who is eternal in the heavens, beyond anything we could ask or think, who is incomprehensible, but has condescended to reveal yourself and has filled us with your own spirit that we might call upon you with knowledge of who you are. Your mercy and love is great toward those who fear you. Your faithfulness never fails. Your justice endures forever. And your peace will be established at the last. Lord God, we give you thanks for the steadfastness and generations of those who are your people, the church, who have been steadfast in service to you in a world that goes the other way. Thanks be to you for generation after generation of faithful men and women, boys and girls, who have maintained your church in this city and throughout this country and throughout the world. By your help, O oh Lord, and strength, we come to you with our prayers for the church. First for our own church, Christ Presbyterian of Janesville, and we, we, we praise you that you have granted us so many things, so much blessing. We pray for increase in our love for each other. We pray for increase in our love for you. For Lord, we know that we only love because you loved us first. The perfect love that is yours, we also pray for our sister church in Rockford, Providence OPC, and for our presbytery and for our denomination, the OPC. Gather all of your people, not just those who have our label or our particular brand of things and understanding, but all who call upon you in truth today, that they may carry out a faithful ministry to this city, this state, to this country, and to this world, that the mystery of godliness that all nations now are called to worship you while you may be found may be on our lips and may be promoted by us. May our Christianity be authentic. May our discipleship be in earnest. May our love for each other and for you be evident to all who see us. And where it is not, O oh Lord, lead us to repent. Lead us in a way that might do you honor, that we may decrease in importance and others may increase. And you, as a result, through the glory that belongs only to you, may be supreme above all. Lord God, eternal, your faithfulness, it continues. You have provided faithful pastors in your church. We pray for Pastor Brian Bell um, and uh, the Providence OPC in Rockford uh, as they meet today as well, or next week as well. Pray for their decision about purchasing, a land, purchasing property and um, pray for their unity and their peace with each other. We ask that you would bless all the shepherds of this uh, presbytery 
Give them gifts of compassion, wisdom, diligence, more and more and more and more patience. Let their learning not be puffing them up. Let their zeal be with knowledge. But may they be men of prayer. And may the congregations in our presbytery be congregations of prayer. So that your name may be glorified among us and in this world. And that we might serve you for generations to come. Raise up new leaders, O oh Lord. Raise up new men and women to disciple those in your church. Lord God eternal, your justice endures forever. We pray for the peoples of this earth, especially those in Africa, Eritrea, Uganda, Ethiopia, we're thinking about, Lord, all those who labor there in that difficult place right now. We pray for our missionaries there. We pray for the Westervelts in Quebec City. And we pray that the, the, the justice, equity, and peace of the gospel may be known through their ministry. Lord, we pray that your mercy um, would be great to those who fear you, as you have promised to do. So fill us with a fear that is holy, a fear that is, that is peaceable. Because your, your faithfulness never fails. We give you thanks. We pray for our own country. For our president, Mr. Trump. For our governor, Mr. Evers. For our congressman, Mr. Stile. Our senators, Ms. Baldwin and Mr. Johnson. And we pray for this election coming up. That we would have peace among us and in this world and in this land. Grant that those who are going to serve you would do so with honesty and fairness and that you would turn their hearts toward you and to do your will. For we know you shall do this as you have promised to do. God, you are the one we ought to fear. You are the one who has the power to condemn or to save you are the one who gives us the gift and promise of comfort in Jesus Christ. The salvation we have, the forgiveness of sins, which is really, really what we need. We pray, Lord, for the members of our congregation who have special needs. Those who mention them and those who do not. And we make mention of them now in the silence of our own hearts. Oh Lord, we pray for ourselves because you know our needs. We lay them before you for you are our God. So to you, Lord God, eternal, one God forever and ever be all praise and honor, glory. In the name of Christ we pray and for his glory. Amen and amen. Please turn in your hymnals now. To Psalm 23 in the responsive reading section, which is on page 791. 791. I'll read the non bold print. You respond with the other. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Uh, let's have the deacons come up here and collect the offering. There's two offerings today. One for 
our regular offering and one for our deacon's offering. As they mosey up, I'll read from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. all stand. We'll be number 97, we praise you, O oh God, just verse 1. you that you would teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes. For your way is a way of life. We pray that we would observe, observe this way to the end by your grace and strength. Give us understanding that we may observe your law and keep it by entrusting ourselves 
body, soul, mind, and strength to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has kept it for us. May our hearts be completely yours. May this word we hear now, this path of your commandments, which is your word, may we find a delight in it as we delight to be in your house today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sit down, everyone. Our first reading comes from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, number, uh, that is, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. 22 through 31. Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31, on page 9, 26 of the Pew Bible. <clears throat> So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art or and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God's Word from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Now, please turn to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. And we will be reading from chapter, chapter 40, verses 12 through 26 this morning. <clears throat> this is on page 600, if you're using the Blue Pew Bible. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge? and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for, uh, casts for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told? 
You from the beginning have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Amen. <clears throat> a while back, one of the first uh, courses I ever took was a um, course through the mail. Back then, you received a, uh, a course on, on uh, a Bible uh, subjects and things like that, and you could get that, and they would send you a cassette tape. Do you know what a cassette tape is? Um, It has no sticky side or anything like that, you young folks. But you get these cassette tapes, and then you would listen to them and do the work and then send them in. Well, I was assigned, uh, because the particular course I was taking was on apologetics. And I was assigned a assignment to write a short paper on Paul's apologetic method in Acts 17. And I hate to say this, but I had no idea what I was talking about when I wrote that. And it was probably 30 years ago that I wrote it. And um, I've gotten smarter, or at least I've gotten less enamored with my smartness since then. And I began to understand that there really isn't an apologetic method in Paul's understanding that goes on in Acts 17. Paul isn't saying that the, that the Athenians have, have erected an idol to the one true God. In fact, he plays off of their ignorance to say, not only are you ignorant of who God really is, it has caused you great pain and death. Acts 17 is filled with condemnation, but it is also filled with the idea that there is no other way but Christ. And that's what last week's sermon was about. The promises of God's comfort come only in Jesus Christ. The promises of his comfort are that we have forgiveness of sins, that he has promised to reveal his glory to us, that he has a sure and certain hope that he has provided that we may trust in, and that he extends this whole program, this mystery of godliness throughout the whole earth, calling everyone from every, not every one, but every tribe and tongue and nation of the whole earth. These promises of comfort, which we looked at last week, are all fulfilled in the redemption which is purposed, accomplished, and applied in that which the Father wants, the Son does, and the Holy Spirit acts in. We call it the will and accomplishment and application of redemption by the triune God. This chapter, chapter 40, like I said, begins this great new part of the book of Isaiah. And it itself, chapter 40, is a summary of of pretty much all of the themes that are going to appear all the way through chapter 66. And we're targeted at those who had been reaping the whirlwind of judgment based on their unfaithfulness and idolatry. Chapter 40 is moving now through these verses to the pinnacle, which we're going to deal with next week, 
in verses 27 through 31, the idea that we have total security and perseverance as God's people, that our strength shall never fail, that we will constantly be tapped into this security which God provides in Christ. The passage before us today, from 12 to 26, talks of the Creator God, who is the great incomparable one. Verses 15 through 20. And rules all the creation as Lord on high. Verses 21 through 24. And has all powers under his soul and complete control. That he upholds it all by his power and will. That he is not contended with. That he is not up for election this election year. And that he is always thus and so. And because he is all this... He can make the promises he made in verses 1 through 11. Forgiveness, glory, hope, and the mystery of godliness. The gospel throughout the world. How could it be any other way that such a God could make these promises? For he has promised never to forget his people, never to forsake his promises, and never to leave them alone. The answer is that it couldn't be any other way. It is God and God alone, the God of the Word of God, the God revealed in the Bible. Verses 12 through 26 answer. How can we trust in these promises in chapter in verses 1 through 11? The answer comes as we are seeing God's great attributes revealed in the passage before us today. But a stern warning does attach to these things. God will not have any business of putting him among a great uh, pantheon of other gods. See, when Paul comes to Athens, he doesn't say that there are a God you need to add to your list. He said that there is only one God. What you need to do is clear this building out of all these idols and worship the one true God who is a spirit, infinite, unchangeable in all of his eternal attributes, goodness, power, holiness, justice, and truth. The idolatry and unfaithfulness of Judah that comes home to roost, which is the target of Isaiah's words that he wrote a hundred years after he wrote them, does this have anything to do with us today? Well, I hope so. Um, for God's truth is eternal. And if we think we are not uh, vulnerable to our own brand of backsliding or of inter, uh, 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 devoid of a need of intervention of God's grace in our lives, we're fooling ourselves. We have just as much need to be having this corrective applied to us as these people did. Acts 17 portrays a people who, I call them, um, they're Justins, you know? You know, like just in case. And we'll believe every possible God there is to believe in, just in case there is one. You know, I um, remember talking with my cousin one time at a, wedding rehearsal, uh, a wedding, uh, not a wedding rehearsal, a wedding banquet. And um, we were arguing, and he's, he's uh, a little younger than me, and we were arguing about the existence of God. And um, the, yes, bartender was listening to us, and um, I, was, uh, I was having a Diet Coke. Okay. Okay. And, and the, the bartender was listening to us, he says, yeah, he says, I believe in God just in case there is one. So ever since then, I've just been calling these kinds of people just in cases. All right, so don't be a just in case. All right, you need, you need to be the, uh, the kind of one who, who takes up God's word at verse 5 uh, of chapter 40 of this, this wonderful passage in Isaiah. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God's jealousy 
for our complete and exclusive worship of Him alone cannot be disputed. He will not share glory with any other supposed God. And he carries this theme all the way through Isaiah 40. He has promised to remake everything in this world according to his glory. And when God promises something, he keeps his promises. Now there are two big, huge distractions in our world that can easily distract us from this glory of God in our lives. The first is a, this rampant idea that man's opinion of the reality in the world is the measure of what's really true. We decide what is good, we decide what is not good. We decide what is desirable, what is uh, of value, and we ignore what God says. This is called secularism or humanism. There's also another great big idol we face in this world, and that is this business of alternative salvations, which is right what these people had come off of in chapters 1 through 39. Secular choices are empty of meaning. The naturalism that is humanism is easily uh, dismissed. It has no weight to it. It has no power in it and is easily recognizable. And so we see now we have a generation of people, old and young, now coming to um, worship anything which might seem to have some kind of meaning. And they turn to all sorts of superstition. I was, um, I was at Green Lake Conference Center. Um, was, this, what was this past January? I think it was, no, past December. And um, now, there's nothing against Green Lake Conference Center, but one of the janitors was coming through the lounge in which I was, I was cleaning, and I decided I was going to engage him in a little talk, and I did, and I started to talk about, um, you know, I uh, wanted to talk about the Lord with him, and as we began to talk, he said, oh, I'm not a Christian. He says, I worship the Nordic gods of my ancestors. And I said, well, I'm Danish. I said, um... I think the God of our ancestors is the God who made us. Um, days, oh no, that's just a superstition. I, you know, I, I just prefer it. It's, just, it's, it's more, more fun or something. I don't know. He had all sorts of things on his phone and etc. It's a sad thing that there is all these just in cases out there. It's really not surprising though when we find so many who grow up in church with Christian parents turning to all of these alternate salvations. This young man had told me that he'd been brought up a good Baptist. Uh, that's why he was working at the center there. And I began to ask him, what, what, has, what really got you off? And he says, I don't think people are serious about, about following what they say. They're full of hypocrites, etc. The church of today, and we're not exempt to this, by the way, as OPC people, although... I would say that we're very conscious of the danger of this. Um, the church of today is a place where God is weightless. You know, the opposite of weightlessness is glory. Literally, the word in Hebrew means heavy. The worship of so many so-called churches is an utterly vapid, wasteless collection of man-centered, man-measured cheerleaders in which God is not praised and his attributes not extolled, nor are his attributes sung of, concentrated on, or preached from the pulpit. Helpful hints about being a parent or a son or daughter, about how to be a good worker, about how to be a good citizen, might come from the pulpit, but God forbid we would ever talk about the heaviness of God's glory. That's kind of a downer for some folks. Well, I want to talk, God willing, and help God helping me about what is real, about what is enduring, about what matters. And what matters is what's heavy. No frivolous platitudes will do when it comes to contemplating the one true God when Isaiah takes up the mantle and says, we should be saying to the nations, behold your God, the heavy the glory, the one who is God. Now, can I, can you, 
Can anyone really describe God? Well, we tried to in our catechism question. Um, no less of a genius than Charles Hodge said, this is the best single expression of who God is that he could find anywhere. I think he was biased being a Presbyterian, but Charles Hodge said this expression, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth is one of the best ever written. What I would say is that may be true, and I would, wouldn't want to disagree with him, but I would also say that what we need to do is not listen to um, anything other than that which would reflect the truth that is in the Word of God, and there is so much more than that catechism question in the Word of God. When we are confronted with the God who is in the Scripture, we are confronted with the heaviness of God's glory. We are confronted with the absolute seriousness that He and He alone is the one who can make and fulfill the promises that matter to us in our lives. God did not create you to be a good employee, a good wife, or good husband, primarily. He created you to worship Him in spirit and in truth and to serve Him and to be conformed to the image of His dear Son, Jesus Christ. That is his purpose, to glorify himself in you, that you may enjoy him forever. That's heavy. That's not frivolous. There's no humor in that. But that is absolutely the heaviness of glory that we need to concern our hearts about. That is what we need to be concerned about if we're going to take seriously what God's calling upon our lives is. God did not call us to a set of guidelines, a set of commandments even, a list of requirements, a set of procedures, tasks. None of these will ever suffice or take place of the glory of what Isaiah tells us here in this chapter Shall we compare God to anything? No. God's glory is unique. God's glory is above our understanding. When he says, behold your God, he is saying that this is the only one who can give forgiveness of sins, the only one who can reveal the glory of redemption in Christ, the only one who has sure and certain hope, the only one who can spread this throughout the whole world. We see four reasons then, four reasons why the one and only glorious triune God can make and fulfill these promises. And these are, these four reasons are the application of verses 1 through 11. First in verses 12 through 14, God can make and fulfill His promises because He is the Creator. Now the most obvious implication of God as Creator, to me, and as I look at this particular passage, is the wisdom that God possesses. Now, maybe, maybe you have a different idea. Maybe that's not the first idea in your thoughts, but that's the first idea Isaiah brings to us. These are facts. He measures the waters in the hollows of his hand. He marks off the heavens by the span. He calculates the dust, weighs the mountains in a balance. These facts God makes meaning of in showing that he is the one who is wise above all else. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Wisdom is taking the facts of knowledge and applying them to the purpose of God. It is not enough to know facts without also applying them as God has those facts taken. Now next to this wisdom is probably the first thing you think of when you think of God as creator. You think of his power over everything. 
that he knows all and sees all, that he has touched everything. Unlike us, his reach never exceeds his grasp. We have become agents and technicians of death, human beings have. We have devised more ways to kill people, unborn people, and people walking around than any other period of time in the history of, of the whole world. There is no evil that we do not try to grasp. Our reach, though, exceeds it. We cannot control that which we have. In fact, we are constantly on the precipice of disaster. We could kill ourselves at any moment. This wisdom, unlike God's wisdom, is not real wisdom. For God's wisdom is the wisdom which says that what is His power is His wisdom. What He decides is good is good. What he decides is love, is love. What he decides is marriage, is marriage. What he decides is life, is life. What he decides. And our opinion doesn't come into it. For he is a wise creator. This wisdom and this sovereignty combine to teach us that God not only made what we can measure and see around us in the creation, but he has also made the unseen things like goodness and love and truth. Job struggled with this business, didn't he? For 37 chapters in the book of Job, there's all this struggle about what and why this happened to Job. Now, in chapter 38, Job is told by God, now look here, I'm going to ask you some things. Since you're so smart, Job, you instruct me in what is ought to be. And by the time he gets to chapter 42, what does he say? I repent in dust and ashes, for I know nothing. What is God saying? Job, you think you know how things ought to be? You can't even tell me how things really are. Your reach has exceeded your grasp. It is God's wisdom, folks, that matters. God's glory. That matters God's opinion of what is good and right and proper. Not ours. So, God can make and fulfill these promises because he's the creator. These promises, forgiveness, hope, glory, and the mystery of the gospel through the nations. These promises God can make also because he's the incomparable one. Verses 15 through 20. He's the incomparable one as the one who is alone to be feared. Verse 15. The nations are like a drop from a bucket. Must just Rome, Greece, the Medes, the Persians, the Huns, um, the Holy Roman Empire, the, uh, the USSR, the Turks, the Nazis in Germany, uh, the United States of America, China, um, well, just name it. Whatever country, whatever great power exists, drop from a bucket. A speck of dust on a scale, hardly worth mentioning in its weight. Compared to God, a breath, nothing. He is the weighty one. He is the one who lifts up the islands like fine dust. Verse 16, his incomparability is that no human estimation can ever do him justice. Even if we were to burn all of the cedars of Lebanon and pile every animal in that whole forest upon the altar of burnt offering, it would not be enough to be doing justice to his heaviness, to his glory. Try as we might, our religion, our man-made religions, never do him justice. We can say, uh, we can say things like, uh, God uh, 
is good, but we don't know really what good is apart from God telling us what good is. We can say that um, God is eternal, but we have no more idea about what eternal is. Your brain starts to hurt if you start to think about God having no beginning. And you must receive what he says by faith. If he has no beginning, he has no beginning. That must mean that there is nothing that he depends upon. He is incomparable to any representation which a human being might come up with. That's why our second commandment says don't make a representation of him, an analogy of him. Don't make an image of God to worship it. The question, to whom will you liken him, there is nothing like God. He has, and it's a fancy word, aseity. That means he's independent of any other thing. It's, in fact, that is his name in Hebrew. I exist. I am. Existence is what I am. There is no existence without I am. So God, he can make these and fulfill these promises because he's the creator and because he's the incomparable one. But he can also make and fulfill these promises of forgiveness of sin, hope of resurrection, glory of being revealed in Jesus Christ and the mystery of the gospel throughout the nations because he's Lord of all as well. He's creator, he's incomparable, and he is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of all from the very beginning of time. Do you not know, have you not heard, verse 21 starts to declare, has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. The eternal Son of God, always in the presence and bosom of the Father, the Holy Spirit always moving, the triune God existing from all eternity past, in the present and all eternity future, the God who never needs to wait to know something, who knows you in every detail and loves you anyway, loves me anyway, the one who is patient with us when we contemplate these great truths that he is the Lord of all from the beginning of time and yet we don't allow it to sink into our hearts, that if he is Lord of all, that we have no opinion about his goodness, that his goodness is revealed to us, that his goodness is what he defines it to be. Isaiah here He's identifying something that we don't always comprehend the full impact of what we know to be true. He said, haven't you heard? Haven't you known? This is not, a, this is not complicated. What God tells you about himself in the word is who he is. We've got to take that heaviness of glory seriously. The Lord is above all human power, all human intellect, all human opinion. Does that have any impact right now upon uh, how you're feeling lately as you are bombarded with commercial after commercial on the political front? It ought to. Because this God, who is Lord of all over every human power, does not stand for election, nor is he subject to challenge. He is a Lord without any meaningful opposition. Verse 24, scarcely have they been planted, who? The rulers of the earth. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely have their stock taken root in a sand dune. He merely blows on them and they wither. <laughs> and the storm carries them away like stubble. As Jesus said to Pilate as he was facing the cross, you would have no authority at all if my Father in heaven did not give it to you. 
You want to know who to fear? You want to know who really who is in charge? It is the one who made us. The one who is incomparable. The one who is Lord of all. God in heaven. No candidate, no policy, no promise made by a candidate or a policy is able to challenge the lordship of God himself and his Christ who rules on high. The world and its powers are no more solid than a tuft of grass sitting on a sand dune with the wind blowing over it. The flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of our God lasts forever. He is creator. He is incomparable. He is Lord of all and can fulfill his promises of forgiveness, hope, glory, and the mystery of the gospel because finally also he is the upholder of everything. Verse 25 and 26. Third time we're asked in certain language, what is like God? Who is like God? What we're introduced here to is an involved God. God just meddles with us. God does meddle with our lives. He intervenes. Thank God he does. Intervenes in our lives. He, he gets involved in us. He is not far off from us. That means he loves us. See, that's what is meant here. In verse 26, uh, the New American Standard translates it, created these stars. I think that's uh, warranted here. He's talking about look up in the sky and see all the things you see up there. You know, the deist, one of our presidents, one of our early presidents was a deist, who was very comfortable from the fact that God is far away from us. You know, he just sort of creates everything and then sort of flicks the switch and just lets it roll. He's the God of the Heisman Trophy, you know. Stay away. Get, stay away. Arm's length from me, God. The God of Bette Midler's silly song, God is watching us from afar. Well, they're really comfortable with that because that kind of God doesn't meddle and has no weight. God, the God of glory, has weight. He has weight in our lives because he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. What will you do with this weight of glory that is Christ? Is it your hope? Is it your forgiveness? Is it this counting on the presence of God, the redemption displayed in your life? Is it... Is it on your lips as you carry it to the rest of the world? The deist God is by no means the God of the Bible. Um, think about what Isaiah is saying here. I, I don't know if you're into this kind of thing, but um, if you were to take your finger and put it up to the sky, that would be about one, one degree of uh, arc in the sky. And then if you take one square degree, just that little... That little itty bitty square. How many stars do you think there would be in that square? One with 17 zeros behind it. And God knows the name of every one of them. Do you think he's going to forget about you? Who he created in his image and sent his son Jesus Christ to die for? and longs to see your conforming to that same image and is affecting that without fail? What Isaiah is telling us is that God wants us to see something about himself as he is revealing how he knows even the stars by name. The implied thing is that the love of God which drives him to uphold and not miss a beat of any part of the history of the creation this same love so particularly expressed to the hearts of believers in them being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. This particular love is that love which upholds us as well. Forgiveness and glory, hope and the mystery of the gospel are all in his promises because he is creator, incomparable, the Lord of all and upholder of his people. 
In this section of Isaiah 40, we have to ask, which set of promises are we going to believe? Are we going to believe man's with all the empty posturing? Are we going to be like the Greeks with their silly statues in the pantheon? Or this unknown God is just part of a very many other kinds of gods we trust in? No, no, of course not. Superstition and empty spirituality concocted by man to lure us away from the eternal weight of glory is a temptation we must be aware of. It is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who possesses that weight of glory which has any and makes any difference to us. God has promised himself in all of this weight of glory. He has promised to reveal himself in that glory. He has promised us this, though we be sinners, though we wander, though we are apart from him sometimes, though we uh, don't obey everything he says, though we are prone to wander from the home that he, that he prepared for us, though he has promised all that, the forgiveness of sins, glory, hope, the mystery of the covenant. In all that, he still is faithful. He still loves his children. The God who orders everything, who created, who ruled, who is unchallenged and upholds, right down to the last star in the heavens, will never forget a single one of his children either. You can count on it. Christ is the weight of glory revealed to us. In him, all the promises of this God, the, in, the incomparable Lord, the, the, the unique God, the loving God, are summed up in the cross and the resurrection. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ today. Even if you've called on him before, call on him again. For you need the weight of glory in your life. You need what God has given. The only thing that matters. His presence. His power. His love. In Christ to you. Let's pray. Lord, we do... We do stand in awe of the perfection you are. And often, oh Lord, we... We do confess that we liken other things to you. We like it when you're easy to deal with, when you're not threatening. But we would long to see your glory, Lord, to see the heaviness and weight of your glory. For that is where we shall dwell in eternity if we are yours. And so we pray for the strength of our faith to be increased, the depth of our repentance to be increased, the love for you and for each other, likewise, to be increased by your Holy Spirit. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray to you, Father. Amen. Standing up, we're singing number 125, Let All Things Now Living, number 125.
the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Amen.